Hello everyone. I want to continue our study of the history of early Christianity with a look at anti-Nicene leaders and literature. All right, now what does anti-Nicene mean? Nicene refers to the Council of Nicaea, which took place in 325. And the Council of Nicaea really represents a major turning point in the history of Christianity. We've already talked about the conversion of Constantine and how that placed Christianity in a position of, of imperial favoritism. All right, whereas before Constantine, uh, Christianity was on the outside and uh, was a, uh, a often illegal, it was persecuted. Uh, nonetheless, it was separate from the state, not so after Constantine. And so the word anti, all right, don't confuse that with uh, anti with an I, meaning against. No, anti with an E means before, all right? If you travel through the South and you visit an antebellum home, that's a plantation built before the war, all right? If you are a poker player, which I am not, uh, before you begin the game, you have to ante up, right? Okay, so ante means before. So this is a period of time before uh, Nicaea, before the major turning point in the history of the church, anti-Nicene leaders and literature, all right? Let's uh, move on and talk about the Apostolic Fathers. The Apostolic Fathers is a term that refers not only to uh, the early leaders of the church, but also a package of writings, all right? So many of them, they're authors we know, others we do not. But Apostolic Fathers is a term we use to refer to a period of time uh, when the uh, we call it the sub-apostolic period just at the end of the lives of the apostles and just afterward all right so let's see what this includes all right so uh, an apostolic father is one who had come into contact with the apostles and so many of these uh, leaders will be very early um, and their writings are characterized uh, in a number of ways. Most of them are devotional and edificatory, all right, meaning they're uh, designed to build up uh, the readers. Some were considered inspired. We'll see a few of these on uh, canon lists uh, later on. Uh, they typically are informal letters, stories, allegories, uh, nothing in the way of systematic theology. They reflect a Hebraic way of thought, that is, a, uh, they reflect Jewish Christianity, um, and the Septuagint is the primary scriptural authority. In other words, when they quote scripture, they're quoting from the Greek translation of the Hebrew scriptures. And during this period of time, the church is healthy and relatively free of corruption. All right, let's begin with a look at 1 Clement. Uh, this is an epistle written to the Corinthian church by Clement, who was the third bishop of Rome. It was written around 96, so toward the end of the first century. All right, the church at Corinth is still a problem, even decades after Paul founded and wrote to that church. And so uh, Clement in Rome is actually uh, extending his authority uh, from Rome to Greece to correct dissensions. Uh, often he used illustrations from the Old Testament. Uh, this is an important uh, use of the Old Testament in the early church. And it is in this letter that we gain information about the martyrdoms of Peter and Paul, who died in Rome under the persecution instigated by Nero, as we have discussed. 
And also in this letter, Clement pleads for unity and discipline, uh, much as Paul had done uh, decades earlier. Now, as late as 170, 1 Clement was read in Corinthian churches alongside scriptures, and so it was considered authoritative uh, even then. Now, the next book in the Apostolic Fathers is called Second Clement, but this document is incorrectly attributed to Clement, and it is not even an epistle. Instead, it is a homily, and in fact is the earliest Christian sermon still in existence. Probably it was preached in Corinth, and uh, when it was transcribed, it was incorrectly attached to the letter from Clement, and therefore uh, later historians refer to it as Second Clement. And in this homily, uh, the preacher discusses uh, the Christian's moral combat. Next, we want to talk about Ignatius of Antioch. We've already mentioned Ignatius as one of the early martyrs, but let's see what else we can learn about him. Uh, his nickname was Theophorus, which means bearer of God. And of course, this makes sense that as he ministered, he was the bearer of God's image. He was the bearer of God's message. But if you shift the accent, to call him Theophorus, well, this means born by God. And this reflects a, uh, a legend about Ignatius that he was the child uh, that was mentioned in the Gospel of Matthew, chapter 18. Uh, Matthew reports that Jesus called a child to himself and set him before them. And said, Truly I say to you, unless you are converted and become like children, you will not enter the kingdom of heaven. Whoever then, then humbles himself as this child, he is the greatest in the kingdom of heaven. All right, this obviously is the stuff of legend, uh, but nonetheless, it was claimed of Ignatius that he was that child. Now, as we know, Ignatius was arrested in Antioch under Trajan's policy. Possibly he was betrayed. Possibly he volunteered. We've already talked about his eagerness for martyrdom, and he was transported to Rome for that purpose. Now, in route, he wrote seven letters, uh, five uh, to churches in Asia Minor, one to Rome, and one to Polycarp. Uh, the Bishop of Smyrna, and his letter to Rome is part of your reading assignment. Now, these letters were highly esteemed and widely quoted in the early church, and these letters are included in the Apostolic Fathers. Now, in these letters, he discussed the church organization as it existed in Antioch at the turn of the second century, and he stressed obedience to the bishop, whom he considered to be the safeguard of Christian unity against heretics, especially Judaizers and Docetics. And we will discuss Ignatius's warning, warnings against heresy in our uh, next lecture on heresy and orthodoxy. Now, he claimed that uh, the church should do nothing without the bishop. That is, baptism, the Eucharist, and marriage, all of these should be conducted, administered by the bishop. Now, this is fairly early in the church uh, and may have been uh, unique to Antioch and not a widespread policy, but eventually we will see the uh, development of the episcopacy, that is the hierarchy of the church, where the bishop does uh, gain authority over his bishopric for the purpose of um, 
uh, Christian unity and uh, doctrine. Now, he was an early advocate of sacramentalism in baptism and the Eucharist. He referred to uh, the uh, practice of consecrating the waters of baptism, making them sacred. He talked about the Eucharist as the medicine of immortality, as if taking part in the Eucharist uh, was sacramental, or that is, was an, uh, a, a, a conductor of grace. All right, so these seem to be very early in the church, and so uh, many people feel like this was uh, uh, focused mostly on Antioch, but again, we're going to see this spread uh, throughout the church uh, very soon. Now, the next person uh, among the apostolic fathers is Polycarp, Bishop of Smyrna, and according to Irenaeus, Polycarp may have studied under John the Apostle, making him a link between the apostolic age and the second century apologists. And uh, as we know, he received a letter from Ignatius. He was Bishop of Smyrna uh, early in the second century. And we know from our study of his martyrdom that he died about 156. Now, uh, the martyrdom of Polycarp is one of the documents among the Apostolic Fathers, but also there is an epistle to the Philippians attributed to Polycarp. And uh, current uh, scholars see in this one document two letters. In chapters 13 and 14, even though they come at the end, uh, possibly were written earlier and were uh, intended originally to be a cover letter for a collection of uh, the letters of Ignatius. And then what we have as chapters 1 through 12 were written 20 years later to denounce Marcion, whom, as we will discover, was a serious heretic in the uh, early 2nd century. Most of uh, the epistle was composed of direct and indirect references to scripture. And so this is important for us to see how the scriptures were quoted in early uh, uh, documents, letters, treatises written during this sub-apostolic era. All right, the Didache uh, was an important church manual. Uh, it uh, has a subtitle, The Teaching of the Twelve Apostles, but there is no real connection to the Twelve Apostles. It originated in Syria around 70 AD, and so you can see how uh, it was uh, written actually uh, during the time that uh, some of the, the Gospels and other uh, general epistles were being written. So it was written during the New Testament times. Now, the document as we have it was uh, redacted, that is, edited uh, repeatedly. Probably the final edition that we have in our current uh, 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 Apostolic Fathers probably was completed at 120. This was a church manual of moral instruction and church order. It opens with six chapters on the two ways. Uh, the way of darkness and the way of light. And these, uh, this discourse functioned as a catechesis, as a way of training new Christians. It's followed by sections on baptism, fasting, and prayer. Uh, another section on the Eucharist, and then it talks about apostles and prophets, how to deal with uh, traveling preachers. All right, the Didache, really a very valuable document to uh, tell us how the early church conducted itself. The Epistle of Barnabas is a pseudonymous letter, which means that it really wasn't written by uh, Barnabas uh, of, the, of the book of Acts, but it was originated in Alexandria, by someone who 
uh, signed it Barnabas in order to uh, get traction, to get noticed. It was a, an epistle that was hostile to Judaism. So we see some early anti-Semitism in this document. The author uh, insisted that Christians, not Jews, are the true people of God. And it also includes a discourse about the two ways, showing that both uh, this epistle and the Didache borrowed from a commonly accepted uh, a, a teaching about the two ways. Now, the Shepherd of Hermas possibly is, uh, uh, after the letters of Ignatius, the most important of the Apostolic Fathers. This is an uh, apocalyptic writing, so very similar to Revelation, uh, in that there's a series of revelations uh, about the future given to the author, uh, who is Hermas, uh, first, uh, an old woman uh, presented these revelations, and then second, by an angel disguised as a shepherd, hence the name Shepherd of Hermas. Uh, there's also religious allegory included in this, uh, this treatise. The purpose of uh, the shepherd was to preach repentance, to teach that a Christian who commits serious sin after baptism has only one chance to be restored through penitence. All right, now this may seem uh, severe to us, uh, but it uh, just means that the early Christians took sin very seriously. But please uh, note that um, there was a distinction between mortal sin and venial sin before between serious sin and light sin. We'll talk more about that in just a minute. All right, now the author, Hermas, was the brother of Pius, who is Bishop of Rome, about 140 to 150. So this is, uh, this is more than 100 years after the uh, earthly ministry of Christ. Now, Papias is uh, another author included in the Apostolic Fathers. Uh, according to Irenaeus, Papias was a companion of Polycarp and John, so a person to be taken seriously as a knowledgeable Christian. Uh, he wrote a treatise called Expositions of the Oracles of the Lord, but the expositions themselves do not survive. All we have are quotations uh, preserved by Irenaeus and Eusebius. But we do learn two important things from Papias. One, Mark became the interpreter of Peter and set down everything he remembered of the words and actions of the Lord. And so from Papias we learn that the Gospel of Mark is actually uh, based upon the memoirs of Simon Peter. And so that gives the Gospel of Mark the authority of the Apostle Peter. And then Papias says that Matthew composed the oracles in Hebrew and everyone translated them as best he could. Now there's many different interpretations about what Papias meant by this obscure statement. It suggests that Matthew wrote a gospel in Hebrew, uh, but that is not the gospel we have in our possession, which obviously was uh, originated in Greek. Uh, but nonetheless, we do understand from Papias that Matthew wrote a gospel, possibly he wrote one in Hebrew and then wrote another in Greek. Okay. But uh, Papias is an important apostolic father. Moving beyond the sub-apostolic period of the late 1st and early 2nd century, let's talk now about 2nd century apologists and polemicists. Uh, an apology is not saying, I'm sorry, I'm a Christian. Uh, an, 
an apologetic writing is a defense of the Christian faith. And this was very important during a period of time when we're seeing so much persecution of Christians. The apologists are writing to defend Christianity against outer attacks. Now, a polemicist is one who attacks heresies, and the heretics are threats uh, from within the church. And so during the second century, we have a number of writers that are apologists and polemicists, and they are important to our understanding of early Christianity. Let's look at Justin Martyr. We've already talked about him as a martyr, but today we want to talk about him as an apologist. He was born in Samaria to pagan parents and began to search out uh, a, what is the truth through a series of philosophies, Stoicism, Aristotelianism, Platonism. But eventually, in Ephesus, walking along the seashore, he encountered a bearded man who spoke to him about the true philosophy, Christianity. When Justin heard uh, the gospel of Jesus Christ, he knew that he had found uh, the true philosophy that he had been seeking all of his life. So he converted, he became a Christian philosopher, and he established a school in Rome. Now, uh, in Rome, he encountered uh, um, um, a philosophical competitor named Crescens. Uh, Crescens uh, had a public debate with Justin. Uh, Justin clearly won the debate and uh, uh, as a result Crescens went to his uh, his sponsor Marcus Aurelius and arranged uh, for uh, Justin's execution. Uh, but uh, during his life and ministry he was the foremost apologist of his day. He composed many writings, but only three remain extant today. The first and second apology and the dialogue with Trypho. He addressed his apologetic writings to the emperor and the senate, hoping to uh, defend Christianity to them, thereby bringing an end to persecution. In his first apology, he refutes accusations raised against Christians. You may remember that we talked about the false charges against Christianity, such as atheism and cannibalism. He, is, he writes defenses here in the first apology. He presents and justifies Christianity, and uh, we are uh, in debt to Justin for his descriptions of worship and baptism and the Eucharist. Because there were so many false charges about what happens in Christian worship, what happens in the Eucharist, uh, it was important to him to describe what it was that Christians do. And so we're grateful to him uh, to, for our descriptions of worship from the early church. And so we'll be looking at that uh, later on in this, this semester. All right, his second apology is similar to the first, uh, shorter with some further explanations. And then his dialogue with Trypho is important. It records Justin's two-day conversation with a learned Jew named Trypho. Now, was Trypho an actual person? Was this a record of an actual conversation? Certainly is, it is purported to be. Could have been a simply an imaginary conversation, but in it, Justin defends Christianity against the accusations of the Jews. Uh, and this is a sole example, the only example of an apology directed at Jews to present Jesus as the fulfillment of the law. Now, Justin Martyr is remembered as the first Christian thinker 
to seek reconciliation between faith and reason. And as a philosopher, he claimed that traces of truth were found in pagan philosophies, although only Christianity contained the truly rational or reasonable creed. Now, one thing he said was that, uh, that the truth in uh, Greek philosophy came from the Hebrew prophets. Now, this is much debated, but nonetheless, this was his claim that uh, the, the, the truth of the Hebrew scriptures influenced the later Greek philosophies. Now, uh, in Greek philosophy, there was the concept of the logos. We've talked before about the nature of Greek philosophy. That uh, philosophies like uh, Platonism and Stoicism uh, acknowledged uh, a, a, a divine entity, uh, a perfect uh, one or divine being, but this divine being was distant, abstract, impersonal, and did not have direct connections with the creation. And so uh, there was a second being uh, defined as the Logos that was an intermediary between the uh, perfect being and the creation. So Justin Martyr used this term Logos to explain Jesus' function as an intermediary between God the Father and creation. And he said that the reason why Logos became incarnate was to teach humanity truth and to redeem humans from Satan's power. Now, as we will see, Later on, this idea of Jesus as Logos uh, would become problematic because in Greek philosophy, Logos was a created being uh, intended to be the mediator, whereas uh, Christians will affirm that Jesus is not created and is co-eternal. So you'll see how Greek philosophy, as it interacts with Christianity, can be problematic. At the same time, John uh, the Apostle wrote his gospel with the description of Jesus as the Logos, as the Word. But he clarified that the Word was God, the Word was with God, and was in the beginning with God. All right? And so... Uh, logos is a problematic term, certainly is a biblical term that uh, can uh, appropriately be used of Jesus, but it also can be problematic when one compares the term Logos uh, between the Bible and Greek philosophy. Justin Martyr was trying to bridge those two ideas. Now, one of Justin's uh, students was Tatian, and he also was an apologist who wrote an address to the Greeks. Now, whereas uh, Justin tried to um, use philosophy as a bridge from Christianity to pagans, Tatian denounced Greek philosophy uh, entirely and praised the primitive roots of Christianity, it's totally separate from uh, any connection to philosophy. One of his important contributions uh, was the Diatessaron, in which he took the four Gospels and harmonized them into one single uh, collection. And so although we would certainly uh, deny the necessity of a compilation of the four Gospels, whereas we appreciate the four different views of the Gospels. Uh, certainly Tatian's uh, compilation helps us to see uh, how the Gospels were viewed and interpreted in his day. After Justin's martyrdom, Tatian returned to Syria and he founded a Gnostic sect 
uh, known as the Encratites, who were extremely ascetic. I've talked to you about the uh, elevation of virginity, and Tatian uh, asserted that even within marriage, that a husband and wife should uh, forbear from sexual intercourse in honor of the, uh, the preference for virginity that Tatian saw in scripture. Okay, so uh, Tatian's incretism was uh, criticized as a heresy by many of his uh, contemporaries. All right, Athenagoras was another apologist, uh, a philosopher who is best known as the first to elaborate a philosophical defense of the doctrine of the Trinity. Irenaeus, now he is one of the most important of the early church fathers. Uh, he was a native of Smyrna. He sat under Polycarp, therefore completing a link between John the Apostle, Polycarp, and Irenaeus, uh, the church father in the late second century. Now he moved to Gaul, uh, which is now France, and settled in Lyon. He served as a deacon under the bishop Pothinus. And as a deacon, he was commissioned with a letter to the Bishop of Rome. During this period of time, the persecution against the Christians of Lyon began, uh, and so for this reason, Pothinus died and Irenaeus was spared. And so when he returned to Lyon, he was appointed bishop in Pothinus's place. He wrote uh, several documents, but only two are known today. One is the very famous, very important, very influential against heresies, where he attacked Gnosticism, a, uh, a very widespread uh, heresy that we'll talk much about later. And in this document, he formulated foundational principles of Christian theology. He also wrote Proof of the Preaching Apostolic, in which he summarizes Christian beliefs and doctrines. Among the doctrines was his emphasis on God's purpose to draw humanity into unity with him through divinization. This idea of divinization is what we call sanctification. We become more holy as we grow in Christ. For Irenaeus, we become more like God. Irenaeus taught that God progressively unfolded his purpose from the Old Testament to the Incarnation. And he taught a very unusual theory of atonement that we call recapitulation. And he said that Jesus redeemed humanity by assuming each stage of life, including old age. All right, so he said that Jesus redeemed infancy, uh, childhood, uh, youth, and even old age. He claimed that Jesus died at age 50. He based this idea on a very unusual interpretation of a passage in the Gospel of John, uh, chapter 8, uh, verse 56. Jesus says, Your father Abraham rejoiced to see my day. He saw it and was glad. And then the Jews said to him, You are not yet fifty years old, and have you seen Abraham? All right, so Irenaeus took that to mean that Jesus was nearly 50 and would have attained that age by the time of his death. Therefore, Jesus achieved old age, uh, thereby redeeming even that stage of life. Now, from someone who is considerably older than 50, I would disagree that 50 is all that old. But nonetheless, 
we can see how uh, Irenaeus' theology led him to make a serious error in his interpretation of the scripture. Now, Irenaeus is considered the first great theologian. He's often called the father of church dogmatics. And so he is a very important uh, figure in the early church. Clement of Alexandria uh, functioned in the East. Uh, he's best known as the Christian teacher of the catechetical school in Alexandria. Uh, we've talked about the persecution under Septimius Severus, and because he was a teacher, he was a target of the persecution, and so he fled uh, in 202. He's known for three treatises, the Exhortation to the Greeks, the Instructor, and the Miscellanies. Now, he interpreted scripture allegorically, and taught that maturity comes from uh, the understanding of the, uh, the deeper allegorical sense of, uh, of the scripture. We'll talk more about allegorical interpretation under uh, Origen. All right? Origen was born to Christian parents in Alexandria. His father, Leonidas, was a Christian teacher martyr during the reign of Septimius Severus. We've mentioned Origen and his father Leonidas before in connection to the persecution by Severus. There is an interesting story told about Origen that he desired to be martyred with his father, but his mother prevented it by hiding his clothes so that Origen would not uh, follow after his father uh, uh, naked. Now, uh, this is a questionable story. Uh, I often wonder, how is it that Origen's mother got his clothes off of him? All right, I can hear her now saying, you're not going to uh, go and be martyred uh, if you're dirty. So you go get in the bathtub. And while he was in the bathtub, she confiscated and hid his clothing. The other question comes up that, uh, that Origen was willing to be martyred for his faith in Christ, but he was not uh, willing to be seen naked for his faith in Christ. So anyway, just a little humorous uh, story about Origen and, uh, and my interpretation of the events that went on. All right. Uh, now, Origen studied under Clement of Alexandria, and so when Clement fled, he took his place, even though he was only 18. But he had learned much from his father Leonidas, and his family needed the income that he received as a teacher. Now, it's uh, also interesting to note that uh, Origen interpreted literally uh, Matthew 19, 12, where Jesus was talking to his disciples, talking about marriage. Jesus said, uh, not all men can accept this statement, but only those to whom it has been given. For there are eunuchs who were born that way from their mother's womb, and there are eunuchs who were made eunuchs by men, and there are also eunuchs who made themselves eunuchs for the sake of the kingdom of heaven. He who is able to accept this, let them accept it. And so the story is told that Origen actually castrated himself in obedience to this scripture and also to justify his teaching women uh, without the company of others, all right? And so, uh, this is another interesting story about Origen. Uh, Demetrius, uh, who was the bishop of Alexandria, uh, excommunicated Origen for the reason of his castration. And so, Origen settled in Caesarea. He died following the Decian persecution. Now, Origen advocated a triple interpretation of Scripture. 
uh, origin is a classic example of uh, the allegorical interpreter. Uh, he said that there were three layers of interpretation. The first was the literal, uh, to deal with the earthly, carnal, Jewish sense. He said there was a moral level to deal with the religious matters of life. And then there was the allegorical level related to heavenly life and the world to come. Let me share an example of Origen's allegorical interpretation. And this comes to me via J.N.D. Kelly's book, Early Christian Doctrines. But Psalm 3.3 says, But you, O Lord, are a shield about me, my glory, and the one who lifts my head. Okay, according to Origen, his literal interpretation is that David is speaking this psalm. The second level is the moral or the typological level where he sees Christ speaking uh, and Christ knows in his passion in his suffering that God will vindicate him but then in the on the spiritual level it is every just soul who by union with Christ finds his glory in God okay so you can see this triple uh, interpretation of scripture Let's go ahead and move to one of my favorites of the early church fathers, Tertullian. Uh, he was raised a pagan in Carthage, North Africa. He was well educated in law, literature, and rhetoric. He was converted about 195 in Rome. Uh, some believe that he went to Rome to further study the law, and while there, he was a witness to the persecution and martyrdom of Christians. And uh, he was attracted to Christianity uh, because of their faithfulness to Christ. And this, of course, is the origin of his statement about the blood of the martyrs being the seed of the church. He became the first Latin theologian, apologist, and polemicist. And therefore, he's known as the father of Latin theology. He later became an adherent of Montanism, which was a reforming sect known for its rigorism, for its uh, zeal for Christian practice. We'll talk more about Montanism in our discussion of heresy and orthodoxy. Now, over 30 treatises uh, by Tertullian survive and they can be arranged in different uh, categories. He wrote a lot of apologetic writings to the nations, uh, the Apology, uh, the treatise to Scapula, a lot of polemical writings against the uh, uh, heretics, including the prescription of the heretics, saying that heretics should not have access to the scripture, cannot use scripture in their arguments because they use it incorrectly. He wrote against Praxius. He wrote against Marcion. We'll talk about these uh, among the, our, our discussion of the heresies. Now, he wrote what we call Catholic works. Again, not Roman Catholic, but nonetheless, during his period of time as a member of the established church, he wrote a treatise on baptism, another one on prayer, on patience, on penitence, and then during his uh, period as a Montanist, uh, he wrote on modesty, on fasting, on monogamy, on flight from persecution. Now, just because he's writing as a Montanist does not mean that he is a heretic because some of his most profound doctrinal writings were during this era of his life. Now, this may be the most important thing that I tell you about Tertullian. He formulated two concepts that were fundamental to Christian doctrine. Was his 
One was his Trinitarian formula, one substance, three persons. He used a kind of a real estate uh, illustration for this, that uh, divinity, the Godhead, is one substance shared by three persons, the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit. As you know, one piece of property can be owned by three individuals in the same way Godhead can be shared by the three persons of the Godhead. The other uh, formula that was so important is his Christological formula, that Jesus is one person with two natures. All right? Extending the real estate idea, one person can own two properties. And so Jesus had two natures. He was truly God and he was truly human. I cannot overstate the importance of Tertullian's Christological formula. It settled the issue in the West. Uh, in the East, it took 250 more years before they understood what Tertullian was saying, and Tertullian's uh, Christological formula will play an important role in the uh, Council of Chalcedon in 451, as we will see. All right, so we have uh, completed our survey of just a selected number of uh, apostolic fathers uh, and anti-Nicene leaders and literature. And so I hope that you have uh, learned from this summary. Uh, many of these issues will continue to play an important role throughout uh, the early church, the medieval era, even the Reformation, and they continue to be important today. Thank you for your attention.